I am ready. Sound check. Sound check. Um, I might. Um, I mean, the microphone is is the computer microphone because I'm using the uh, the headphone one for for the stream. So I'm not sure if I like. You can you hear me from here or is the volume?
just give me a sign when you're Hey everyone, um, hope everybody can hear me. So we are going to hear to talk about um, behavior graphs and halves. Um, uh, we'll do the presentation and then afterwards we can spend some time. We can open a QA uh, turn and and we will open the the mics for everyone. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, so the name of the of the talk is uh, Turbocharger Halves Rooms with Behavior Graphs. Uh, and you can see Dom, Dominique, that used to work at the Habs team in the background because he's, he's basically, he started this project. So it's uh, like a, most of his is, is his work. Okay, first of all, a disclaimer. Um, all the code is still highly volatile. Um, the changes that we do on the client or on the add-on side can break scenes we have been working on. Uh, no retro compatibility should be expected until this is released, which um, should be soon. But uh, if you are using it right now or in the next days, then just keep that in mind. Uh, so yeah, right on that, don't, don't use it in production. And because there's a lot of things that have not been tested. And one example is VR support, for example. Um, we haven't really tested that. So it might work or it might not, but um, don't expect that to work flawlessly. Um, so what are behavior graphs? Um, so essentially they are a way to add logic functionality to a room without without coding, without needing to extend um, or fork the, the Hubs client and add your own logic or uh, uh, nothing like that. So you just need to um, you just create a graph and the logic is embedded there and that will run with the when the room is 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 started. So it's perfect for artists, for example, but not only, like everyone can, uh, for, even for developers that they can embed some logic, that's a great option too. Um, so it's kind of the missing part in Hubs that everybody was waiting for uh, that allows Hubs to, that allows the, the actual social interactive experiences. Um, well, these in different flavors are present in similar platforms like, or in other platforms like Unreal or Unity Visual. Unreal has uh, the blueprints uh, in Unity is called Visual Scripting, in VRChat is called Udon, in Rec Room it's called Circuit. Uh, um, the graphs are created, perhaps the, the graphs are created in, in Blender and, and exported as part of the GLTF as an extension that is uh, it's called the MOS behavior extension. There's an spec that is not yet finalized, which is the KHR, uh, the Kronos behavior, KHR behavior. Um, we are not using the same name because uh, because we're it's like waiting for the spec to be finalized. And uh, but for now, we are just using our own our own extension. But that might change in the future when the spec is out. Um, behavior graphs for apps are powered by this library, which is called Behave Graph. Uh, it's created by Ben Houston, and, and yeah, we use it for in the Hubs client and also for ex exporting the the node spec that we load in the Blender add-on. Um, here you have the link to the GitHub repository and also uh, the Discord channel for Behave Graph. I will share this presentation after in the in the Discord channel, so you will have access to all the links and uh, the presentation. So what can I do with behavior graphs that I wasn't doing uh, yet in Hubs? So the main use is adding interactivity to scenes. So things like getting access to areas, like doors that, that open and close based on uh, the player entering a certain trigger area, uh, hiding and showing objects, reacting to, to events, um, changing lightning, changing materials. Uh, so you can basically create a full game inside Hubs. Or create a very like a like a social very like rich social experience. Um, yeah, our behavior graph implementation, which is the behave graph implementation, implementation is string complete. So technically speaking, you can do anything that you can do with a computer with enough power and time. Um, so it's it's pretty powerful. So here we have like a couple of examples about behavior graphs in action. Um, the first one is. Um, 
you can see like uh, on the bending machines where the avatar is gonna click on on, on the buttons and then that's gonna get one of the items from the shelf. Um, and the second one is one of these uh, claw machines which grabs a ball and then like um, put it back on the returns it to the player. Um, so these are examples of experiences that are made with behavior graphs. Um, the way we create graphs for Haps is in is inside Blender. Um, so far, we, we might uh, add support for the web version of this, which will be uh, in Spoke. But for now, it's just like easier for for starting the kicking off kicking off the project to to do it in Blender. Um, so you you have to do it there for now. Um, so graphs in Blender is just a, collect, a collection of nodes that define the flow of your application. So you have, um, and you will need this uh, specific add-on to to use this, which is the behavior graphs add-on. You will find the link at the end of the presentation. So you have this collection of nodes that define the flow of your application. Um, they have an editor inside Blender. It's uh, the editor will only show if you have the behavior graphs add-on installed. Um, and you will see that that behavior graph um, item there uh, in the editors. Um, the behavior graphs in, in Blender can be attached to an object or to the scene. So every object can have their own behavior graphs collection. And the workflow is very similar to other uh, Blender editors, like the Sader editor, for example. So you have these, uh, you will recognize these if you are familiar with Blender because uh, this is the same as the material uh, editor or the, or the material panel in the object panel. And you can, you have these slots that you can create and then you can uh, add behavior graphs to, to those slots. Um, and the slots can, the, the behavior graphs can be reused between different objects. So you can um, create a new slot in a different object and assign uh, a behavior graph that already exists to that object. So you can reuse behaviors. Um, this is a quick overview on the types of nodes that that uh, we support. Um, so it's like the first type that it will be like event nodes, which is the the node that ex starts the execution of the of the graph. Um, they have no input. They might take parameters, like in this in this case is a is a target uh, entity or object, and they have an output flow socket which will continue the execution of the graph, and optionally some parameter. In this case, it's an entity because it's a collision node. Uh, when it triggers, um, it will output also the entity that's inside the the trigger volume. Um, next is uh, flow nodes. So they evaluate when trigger um, and they optionally can output a parameter. So you will uh, be evaluated and continue the execution through the output flow. They can have input and output parameters. Um, we also have function nodes. Uh, there's no flow sockets in this case. They are only evaluated on demand. So the output will be plugged on some other node like a flow node and with that flow nodes trigger then they will request it will request the the value from this from this node and this node with will, will execute and, and the another category is uh, async nodes which is a special type of node that is kind of like a flow node but will remain active until the end of the execution for example the delay node is one of the examples of that type of async node um now I'm gonna go over the node categories inside uh, inside Blender. This is the Hubs uh, Behavior Graphs add-on. So what we have right now, uh, roughly, is uh, so an events category which have like nodes, like life life, life cycle nodes, like for example, on star, on on end, on tick. So when the graph starts ex executing, when the graph ends, and every time the graph ticks, uh, player events like when a player joins, a player leaves. Uh, or a player enters the collision volume or stays or exits. Uh, same for entity. Uh, we have collision related nodes for node events for, for entities, uh, for uh, colliding a uh, trigger volume, exiting, staying. And then we also have uh, custom local events, which basically are useful for splitting graphs. Then we have an uh, entities category where you can get, get and set entities properties like for example visibility position uh, etc uh, get a component inside 
uh, an entity uh, get different entity properties. Uh, we have components, so this will give you access essentially to nodes that give you access to all the components that we support in HAPS uh, in the Blender add-on. Uh, you can get and set local variables uh, of like the, the flow nodes for uh, if else for loop sequences, uh, a lot of um, different math nodes for operations with uh, booleans, integers, uh, floats, etc. Uh, the bag for logging, time related, delay now, uh, getting a set of material properties, uh, animation nodes and player related nodes, which will be, um, for example, getting the local player, teleporting the player, checking if the player has per specific permission, getting the display name, uh, and also showing notification as in the miscellaneous category. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to cover first of all is a couple of important concepts that usually are hidden for the for the user when, when using apps. And you're never exposed to ownership when you are using apps. You just uh, grab an item and you have that item in your hand. So you assume, you assume that it's yours. But I will I would like to go over what happens when you own something. So let's go over some ownership rules. Um, so ownership. Ownership in HAPS is not transactional and is not guaranteed. So you don't request ownership on an item and that's transferred to you and guaranteed that you will get it. Um, in fact, the server, the HAPS server, doesn't know about ownership at all. It's just the ownership is fully resolved on the on the client side. And that and means- Man it... Manuel, your sound cut out in hubs. Oh, sorry about that. Um, let me- um, yeah, well, I'm going to continue. Um, so the server doesn't really know about ownership. Um, it's resolved on, on every client based on the most recent request. So whenever um, whenever a player requests ownership on something, for example, if you grab an object, if somebody grabs that object two seconds after, the ownership is, is, is for that uh, player because the ownership uh, the request ownership later or more recent more recently than than you um so the latest player claiming ownership on an entity uh, gets the ownership um, so just because one client or your client claims ownership on an entity doesn't mean that the other clients will respect that claim um and also okay Oh, a second. I, I, think we have I, hear, some I hear you in hubs with again because I reloaded. The okay. I reloaded. So you can tell people that. Okay, sorry. It seems like we had some issues with the audio, but uh, seems to be okay. Hopefully everybody can hear me in the room. Um, yeah, so continuing with ownership. Um, ownership of a parent object doesn't imply ownership of, of its children. Um, that's also really important to, to consider. Um, and you need another important thing to keep in mind is that you need to own the entity where a company is attached uh, to be able to sync that uh, entity's properties, that component's properties. And we will go over this with examples <clears throat> later. So um, we'll see more more clearly. Oh, sorry.
Yeah, um, as we were saying, ownership. Um, so let's go first about uh, over like a few ownership rules. Um, ownership in tabs is not transactional or guaranteed. Uh, so that means that you don't request it and it's transferred to you. Uh, so you don't grab something and that's going to be yours uh, guaranteed for sure. Um, in fact, the hub server doesn't know about ownership at all. The, the ownership resolves on every client. And this is the, the client that makes the most recent request, the one that has ownership. So if I grab something in Hub's room and somebody else grabs the same item like two seconds after, the ownership is is um, is uh, for that uh, client. So the, um, <clears throat> the latest player claiming ownership on an entity gets it. Um, so just because one client claims ownership of an entity doesn't mean that other clients will respect that claim. Um, no ownership of a parent object doesn't imply ownership of children, that this is important for something that we will see later in an example. And uh, another important thing to keep in mind is that you need to own the entity uh, if you want to sync that, the, like a component properties where that um, component is attached. So how do I take ownership of an entity through behavior graphs? Because in the half room, so far, I think the, the most evident way of taking ownership is just to grab something. So you have like a, for example, a spawner can be a video. So the moment you grab that video, you are taking ownership of it. But in behavior graphs, uh, how do we take ownership? So we have this, uh, uh, this node, which is called take ownership, which basically does that. Um, the moment you, you action that, it will take ownership of that entity that you see there as a parameter, like the door entity. Um, so if you don't take ownership and then you change that entity's component properties, if they are network, uh, they won't be network to other clients. Uh, so you need to take ownership for the properties to be network. So let's see that with an example. So this will be an example of uh, a door that plays animation when the user or the player gets into the trigger volume that will play the uh, open animation. Um, so let's see what happens. So first thing is, well, the first thing is that the player um, enters the collision volume. The second thing we check if it's the local player, then if we are the local player, then we take ownership of the entity where the animation is played and then we play the animation. Playing the animation means that the animation will be played locally. The animation state, as the animation is a, is a network component, um, will that animation will sync its properties with all the remote clients, and all the clients will play the animation. <clears throat> so we probably have seen that there's like a node there uh, in between taking ownership and the player, which is checking if it's the local player. So why do we need to check if the player is a local player? Uh, so imagine that this event is happening in all the clients at the same time. So whenever there is an avatar that gets into a trigger volume, that event is going to trigger in all clients. Um, so in all clients, this graph will, will execute, and they will try to take ownership of the entity. Um, so every client is going to try to take ownership of, of the entity. Um, so they will all play the animation locally. Uh, the animation, the, the ownership winner will sync its animation state with the rest of the clients. And then some unexpected behavior will happen because they are playing an animation, but they are getting sync properties from other, for, for the winner client and they, that they have to do something else with the animation. So that might um, create like unexpected behaviors. So it's important to, to check if it's the local player when you when you are networking, um, because otherwise all all the clients will will do the same. Will all try to take ownership, or play the animation, or try to sync. Uh, some unexpected things might happen. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the the ownership sort of words. So as ownership is not guaranteed, how can I avoid multiple players getting ownership of the same? entity and, and syncing it. So for example, these two players are, this is the same example as before. So you have the trigger volume at the door. The trigger volume is the red square and the door is like that uh, brown um, rectangle. So 
the first player gets into the trigger and takes ownership of the door and plays the open animation. And then the second player, like uh, a second after, goes into the door trigger and takes ownership of the door and plays the open animation. So player two is now the legit owner of the door because as like a later timestamp has uh, taken ownership later. So the animation, the animation state will be synced overriding the animation that player one was just syncing like one second before or, or 0.5 seconds before. So the anim so some unexpected behavior might happen in that case. Um, so how do we deal with with that? Um, so the way of dealing with that is like having like a shared state among all clients uh, to make sure that that we have some sort of like a, um, yeah, like we can check um, certain parameters and and do and take ownership or, or not based on that. Um, well, that that's um, for that we have like the network behavior component where you can attach network properties, and then we have two nodes for setting network property and for getting a network property. And we can see this with an example now. So <clears throat> this is a similar example as before. Um, where, yeah, we we wanna we wanna this is the, the the example that we were we just saw before where two players get into the trigger and want to play and you want only you only want to play the open animation when when one the first um, user is inside for example, so we have first the the collision enter event uh, that is triggered when the first user gets inside uh, and then the thing the first thing that we do is like checking if that shared state that taken variable that we are synchronizing across all clients is taken. So we have we have created this variable that is a boolean that is taken and we check if that variable is, is taken for that for that entity for the door. Um, if it's not taken then we can take ownership because it's free. So we take ownership of the door and then we can we set the value of the taken property to to true, so all the clients now have that shared state and know that the that that door that trigger is taken, and even if they go inside, they won't uh, try to take ownership because it's already taken. So it's like this is like some 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 sort of gating mechanism that you can implement with network properties to deal with these scenarios when you want to guarantee or to that, that guarantee ownership and you don't want different players to take ownership of the same of the same object so yeah this taking ownership of the entity versus the single state of the entity and then when we leave the trigger volume for example um, you clean up the state and you set that taken boolean to to false and now the the door is still is, is, is again uh, available um, another important concept that is quite hidden when you use HAPS and it's important to know when working with, be with behavior graphs is um, how what is the relationship between entities and components in, in HAPS. So let's see that with an example of in the top part is what we use, you will see in, in Blender when creating, a, for example, a video. So it's, uh, usually when you create like a video, you create an empty and you attach a video component to that empty. Um, so that's what you see in Blender, but what's going on in halves? So what happens in halves when, when the scene graph is created based on the GLTF that you export and load, this will create three entities. So the root entity, which will be like the empty in Blender, <clears throat> that's, um, that has like um, some components like the media loader or rigid body component. Um, wait. Did I? Oh, okay. The media loader, the rigid body component. Um, then, um, then is a video object that is the one that has the video component. And then it's another object which is a positional audio object which has like a 3D uh, audio, um, is the 3D audio. That that the video is playing, so it's like the that's it's quite different what you see in Blender from what you see in 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 halves. Like in what you see in Blender is like only that empty, that is the root of the hierarchy. But then uh, in in the behavior graph, for example, 
if you want to change the properties of the video component because you want to play it or pass it, then you want to take ownership of the video uh, component, not the root object. So that's something to take into account, that difference between what's going on in Blender and, and the hierarchy of the scene graph in, in halves. Um, so that might look, the, the, I guess the question will be like, um, why is that happening? Why is not the video attached to the root <clears throat> instead of being a separate child? And then for answering that, you, you need to think about well, what will happen if you if you have like an empty where you attach a video and a water component. Um, should that root be the video mess or the water mess? So that's why the that's why we have these child <clears throat> entities uh, under the root because. Um, depending on on the different components that you attach, um, you might uh, need to create different childs to to represent those those different messes. Mm. So <clears throat> yeah, to see that uh, so to see this difference uh, between components and entities and and how what should we should you use when you when you need an entity property in a node, then we can see with. With this example, so it's basically the same example as before. You have the video component, and you you want to play, uh, you want to play it. So there is this object which is the empty, which has the um, has like the the root. The empty has the rigid body, so the collision will trigger in that object. So you select that empty. Was that's the only entity that is um, that is visible for you in Blender. So so that's the one that you you set as the target for the collision. And that's the root in halves, the root entity. So um, then we check if it's the local player, as we've seen before. Um, and then we have to take ownership. But you can't take ownership of the root entity, because that will be only taking ownership of the root, but not the actual video, which has the video component. So for that we have this node that is get component where you select the component and the entity and that will will look for the for the uh, the entity that has that component that is under uh, the entity that you specify there and then with that with that output you can take ownership of that entity and play uh, media on that entity also so you're actually getting the right entity where uh, where you want to act and so that's a way of of solving. This. So in general, um, and then you are referring to to that entity when using the get component entity. So in general, like the way of thinking this will be so depending on the component, um, the component where the entity is attached might be in the root or child entity. You can't really know. Um, so as a rule of thumb, they always use the get component node to get an entity. Uh, which com which component you want to act on, and and just remember, like ownership doesn't apply to the whole hierarchy under the entity, only the target entity. So if you take ownership of the root, you are only taking ownership of the root, not the actual child that has the the component. So that's why you you need to do like the get component thing. Um, yeah. So from all the components that we have in halves, and you are familiar with the halves Blender add-on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different components for waypoints, um, uh, text, uh, water, like a lot of different things. Uh, so far, not all of them are network. So we only have network, a few of them, the ones that have been uh, done so far. So right now, the things that are network are, for example, the rigid body. Uh, so for the rigid body, we, we will sync, uh, for example, the type, the mass, and the gravity. And you can see there... Uh, underneath the the component, which is new, is part of the the new add-on, and also a node which lets you set different properties: the the type, the mass, and the gravity, uh, and the entity where you will be changing the properties. Another one is the network transform, which is a new component also, um, and the network transform is is uh, the node that I mean the component that uh, lets you sync continuously the position, rotation, and scale of the transform of an object. So for example, the um, if you want to grab an object, we have this component now also that is the grabable. So that makes uh, any object be able to be grabbed. 
uh, and that component will add the network transfer component as a dependency for you. But if you want to change the position of an object through the graph, so you might want to, based on whatever event, um, do like the set empty property like like you see underneath with the set empty property node and change the position of an object. So if you don't have this network transform component attached, uh, that set entity property of the position will only happen locally. We will, it won't be um, network. So nobody else is going to see that that update. Uh, only you. Um, well, same as for any other any other network component, uh, you always need to take ownership of of the entity before before expecting the this these changes to be network. Um, another new component, uh, which is also network, is the network behavior. Um, and what this component does, as we have seen before, is syncing uh, custom properties across all clients. So if, the, if you have an entity which has the network behavior component attached and you take ownership of that entity, uh, then you can start those properties that you can start changing those properties and that uh, state change is going to be reflected in all the clients so they all will have that common shared state uh, which is how we saw before that you can handle these cases where uh, you don't want two players to take ownership of the same item for example but it can be used for anything this is a global shared state um, among all objects and it's attached to every specific object um, another new one is the network animation. Um, so with this, if you attach this to an object, every time you play an animation on it, it will network those updates. So um, so yeah, there's a new set of nodes related to animation, which is allows you to create animation, play animation, crossfade animation. And, and if the component has, I mean, the entity has this, uh, this network animation component attached, then all these properties and all these updates in the property of the component for that entity will be network also, as as long as you own it, of course. But we went. Uh, um, okay, this is um, existing components that now are network, and, and we're still like adding properties, and and we need to add more. So that we expect it to be like expand. And in uh, every week, because now in the, we're in the phase of adding new properties and new components. So the goal is, is to have all the components that we have right now available, uh, all network. Uh, but so far is these three: so audio, media frames, and text. So for audio, you can uh, play, pass, uh, change the source, mute, and loop. Uh, so so with uh, the audio, you will be using the the, the video component, the same as as you were using. Uh, now and and with that node you can change the properties and as long as you own the, you take ownership of the entity um, where the component is attached then you can play pause change the source set mute or or loop uh, and that that state will be networked to to the rest of the of the clients uh, same with media frames uh, you can. Um, as long as you, well, for an object that has a media frame component attached, then you can use this node, say media frame properties to to activate uh, lock or unlock or change the 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 state of snap to center. Um, active for media frames, act, activate and lock uh, are new properties. Uh, activate enables or disables the media frame completely, and lock makes the the object inside the media frame to be locked. So you can't really uh, move it anymore. Um, so that's that's uh, new for the media frames. And then the last one that is network from the classic components is text. Um, and yeah, same case, uh, if you have an entity with a text component attached, then you can use this node and update the text. And that text update will be reflected in, in all the clients. Um, as long as you have taken ownership of the of the entity before, same for the font size and for the font colors, so all these properties uh, you can change um, in your client, and then that will be networked to all all the clients, and they all the whole room will be, will see the same state. Um, yeah, so it's, well, essentially that's what we have now. Um, this um, so if we, this section is specific for people interested in. 
uh, taking a look at this and um, start playing with it. So a few things to keep in mind. Um, this is still a brand. You have there the the link to the brands. I will share these, these slides later, so you can you have access to all the links. Uh, but yeah, the, I was expecting to merge the, these brands um, soon, but we still have some things in flight with the uh, new loader migration. So I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. But I mean, you can already grab it and and expect like a lot of changes, as I said. But but it's, at least it gives you a chance to uh, set it up locally and and start playing with it. You will also need the the separate um, Blender add-on, which is the it's called the Blender GLT behavior graph, um, which adds all these nodes and um, this um, new Blender panels and and editors. Um, so you, with that you can you can create. Um, we'll probably share some examples, at least like working examples at this point, so people can just have an idea of. Uh, of, of what they can expect and what they can do and start tinkering with it. Um, so, okay, all this is built on top of the new BTCS, the new ECS system. So you will need until we make that, like we flip the switch, sort of, so to speak, you will still need to specify the new loader flag to to enable behavior graphs. Without that flag, the uh, yeah, perhaps the Hubs client will ignore the the behavior graphs and, and and nothing will really run. Um, for the rest, it's just as usual. You export the Blender scene, and that will export any behavior graphs that any object or scene has attached, uh, and those will will run, load, and run when when you when you open the room, as long as you have the new loader flag. Um, yeah, this is like um, we probably can. So, this is just the the kickoff sort of meeting. My idea is to have meetings like this every every two weeks um, to keep on talking about these and defining the the, the roadmap and the future. Uh, but so far for now, just keep in mind that for adding, if you're interested in adding new nodes to the client, um, everything is in the source code is under the behavior graph um, folder under under. BTCS systems, I believe. And there's basically all the nodes, all the code is just in one folder, essentially. There are changes in the rest of the code base compared to the main branch, but essentially most of the, the, the code is lives in, in that folder. So if you want to add new nodes, then uh, whenever you launch, uh, you open a hubs room. If you open the console, you will see that the node spec for the nodes are uh, is output there, so you will see the JSON. You can copy that JSON and paste it in the node spec file in the Blender add-on, and that will will add the nodes that you have added in in the Hubs client to the Blender add-on. So that's the, the 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 workflow for for adding new nodes is you have to add them in code, uh, and then copy the JSON file and then paste it uh, in the Blender add-on node spec, and that will add the nodes uh, in Blender. There are some nodes that uh, are like more like custom tailored sort of, uh, but for basic nodes, uh, you can just uh, like create them in uh, in hubs in in TypeScript and then copy paste the, the JSON. But we can go over that in future meetings. Um, oh, sorry. And yeah, the the Blender add-on support, what I said, like the we have like limited support for node spec nodes. So, so depending on the type of node that you you want to create, you might need to add that in directly in Python. Um, so, what is the next steps for the project? So, in the short term, first and um, most importantly, like get this merge in master. Um, then maybe merge also the add-on. With the main Blender Hubs add-on, because of like it's it's very uh, close to Hubs. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of nodes that are specific to Hubs. I'm still thinking about it, but um, maybe we just merge both both add-ons. Um, then probably we need to make some decisions that we're already making based on the on how are we using the nodes that is like st and, and standardize a bit all the different add-on patterns. For example, uh, we created animation nodes, uh, but we also have the loop animation node. Um, so it's can kind of overlap in functionality a little bit. So so yeah, we have to make decisions about uh, what 
type of design do we want that what pattern do we want to follow for for components or this type of things um yeah and the next one is this uh, completeness of having all the components being networks and support for for yeah for you know we have text but <clears throat> but having uh, all the rest of the images um all the rest of the components network and and their properties exposed also in the as a node and then in the mid terms like vr support uh, improved usability there's a lot of usability improvements that can be made on the blender blender side uh, i think navmes uh, obstacle is something that people have been always interested in having uh, maybe having uh, implementing the the spoke side of the of the editor um, so yeah those sort of things and yeah, for if you are interested in contributing, um, yeah, first of all, like there is a Discord channel that you probably all know. Um, so just go join that channel, um, come to the bi weekly behavior graph meetings. Uh, they will be announced in the Discord channel. Um, file bugs or feature requests. Um, then the in the hubs repo is now there is now a tag that is uh, is called behavior graph. So just create a file back or or create a feature request and tag it. And yeah, of course, like contributing, fixing bugs or any feature is always very welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the most important things probably just create cool stuff and just share it. Uh, so we all can enjoy them. And yeah, I think that's, that's it for presentation. Maybe we can open the QA turn. Uh, let me enable the enable the microphone in the room so people can start asking. Okay, now I think I think it should be. Okay, yeah. Well, it's, like, give me a second. I need to things like that. Uh, just a second. Um, okay. Okay. So, anybody speaking? Yeah. Yeah. First yeah. Of all, thanks, okay. Manuel, that was awesome. Um, so, oh, I thank you. See it all in, in presentation form like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah, yeah, I hope it's uh, moderated clear because I think it's a, it's a few complicated um, concepts, concepts in there. It might be confusing at first. Uh, so obviously when you are not used to or you, you're not familiar with certain concepts like network networking or um, the sync graph differences between what you see in Blender and what happens in Haas. So hopefully it could make, we'll make that clear. clear. I think it's going to be like a lot of stuff, but... This is a presentation we will go more in depth over a lot of things in future meetings. I think networking is one of those things that is, when it's done right in an app, nobody knows about it. It's invisible and you don't even think about it. And so that's partially, at least for me personally, why it, it's a newer concept. Um, some of these things are, you know, are newer concepts because I don't normally think about that stuff like oh did you see what i saw when i did this thing in a game you know is it you just assume mm -hmm. it works so um we're, yeah you know as we build our own experiences we have to become more cognizant of those uh levels of detail so to speak mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah no, i mean the, 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 our our ownership, ownership design is it's pretty, pretty similar, similar to most of the other platforms, platforms. if yeah. anybody's familiar with um your chat or red room or <clears throat> or even uh, Unity, or like they have like similar concepts, uh, especially like VR chat is almost the same uh, model. Um, so yeah, it's just like as, as it's not guaranteed, not transactional, then you have to deal with these certain ways, um, and that's why all these. get used to it is not that complicated it's just like following that rule of i need to own something 
to be able to synchronize it because otherwise I'm not sure if I find the owner and um, so I need to to do that. So it's, yeah, I think we debated about, oh, should we make ownership something that happens automatically inside every node? But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think you mentioned that hiding complexities, like sometimes it's gonna bite you in the ass. Uh, like Yeah, the we've end. tried to hide complexity on other systems before, like even in the add-on. Um, and then, you know, by saying like, oh, we'll make it automatically add the components you need or, or, or do some, some sort of like <laughs> magic like that. And often it ends up being something where uh, it, it ends up just, just uh, being a, we paint ourselves into a corner with it. And in a way, you know, as much as we'd love to be like, oh, we, I don't want people to have to learn this topic of networking. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't hurt you to learn it. Um, hmm. it's, it's somewhat universal as some have pointed out, right? Some other apps use the same technology or same, uh, concepts. Um, so, you know, in the end, I, I, I sort of, you know, uh, sort of cringe, but I go, you know what? Yeah. Like people need to understand networking to make that stuff. Um, yeah. but we'll do our best to make it as streamlined as we can. Yeah, no, I think as I said, like it's a only, oh, this is, well, as I said, this is like very, very standard way of dealing with um, the distributed system where, where you want to um, be the authoritative um, entity for doing something like synchronizing on networking properties in our case. Uh, but I, as, I think as long as you get familiar with a couple concepts like, well, what I mentioned here, like, you need to take ownership to do something. Uh, it's good to check, but depending on the use case, but it's good to check for if you are the actual local player when when you get a player for a node, like from a collision node, because because you don't want that. Because you have to think that these graphs are being executed simultaneously in every client. So you, that's the first thing that the change of paradigm. Maybe like you need to change. You need to think like, oh, this is executing in every single computer or well phone or whatever, every single client at the same time. So if a player enters this <clears throat> trigger area, the rest of the, the graph is going to be executed for all of them. So if you don't put some barriers there, like checking if you're a local player, taking ownership, or checking if the ownership is already taken, so um, then it can just be like, like a fight, like an ownership fight where all the clients um, request ownership on that item. And um, the good news is usually you know right away that something is wrong because the, beha the behavior of your scene is strange, right? Like we've probably all seen this in, in one app or another, including this one, uh, where like you go to pick up an object and, and it sort of flickers and looks like somebody else is trying to grab it too. And mm -hmm. Somebody else goes. I just see it sitting on the ground. I don't know. What are you talking about? You know, um, that's usually the a clue that something went wrong with ownership. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think it's something that you have to play with and get familiar. <clears throat> Hopefully, these slides do like a moderate good job on on making it clear. Mm -hmm. But we will. Yeah, in, I mean, for whoever has problems with it or whatever, we can go over it and, and explain it uh, again and again in future meetings. Uh, I will, uh, one of the, the efforts that I want to take on also is like uh, translating these into uh, documentation um, and to make it as understandable as possible. Uh, so everyone can go there and just check it because um, this is the first I time. I was just going to say, I, I want to make sure that um, we do what, what other, I don't know, I, I've used a lot of, you know, software like, you know, Unreal and, and, and Unity and, you know, a lot of these things that have a similar system. Um, the best ones are the ones that on their documentation page also have a like working example, you know, kind yeah. of like you have up there on the screen where you can actually dissect it and go, oh, okay, so that's how I need to do it. Um, yeah. the, wor the worst ones are the ones that were rushed where it just has like, a, a really brief technical explanation of what the thing does. And you're like, I still don't know how to use this. So, yeah, so we'll, exactly. we'll try our best. And actually, I, you know, I hope we can, as a community, um, you know, improve documentation together. Like if somebody has a great example, like add it, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think documentation is key for this thing and trying to make, especially for this couple of uh, items, I think networking and the scene graph and um, so what is it, what type of entity do you need to feed a node? Um, so those those two concepts, I think, is uh, is good to make them very clear because now, I mean, in, when when Hubs was just about like forking and extending the client in code, then you will expect that well, the developers will dive into the code and, this, and like see what's going on and well, read the docs, uh, read the development docs, and, and and go over these concepts because they are documented. But um, but now we have like a different audience. There's people that there are or a lot of people that might only be familiar with Hubs from the user or designer perspective. And that's a completely different perspective because these these things are for you like a transparent. It's like ownership doesn't doesn't is not a thing. It's just like you grab something and well you have it in your hand and that that uh, that cube that you have in your hand now moves for everyone, but you don't really know why it's moving for everyone. You don't know that that is moving because you took ownership of that cube, and that cube has a, a network transform component attached. So. If it has a network component attached and you have the ownership, that means that you are the authority and everyone else is gonna sync your your the properties of the cube that is in your hand. So as you are moving the cube, then everyone, everyone's cube is being moved um, in their in your hand, in their in their clients. So yeah, there's a now a lot of people when making network experiences need to think about these things and it's important because otherwise the experience is not going to work or is is going to be broken in certain scenarios or, or or most of that so it's like it's important to to get this right probably at the beginning when when uh, tinkering with this for the first time then you can't just rely on this being just a local experience and that's fine because you will be focusing on um, uh, making things to work or having like a specific thing and then then at the second stage you will start thinking about okay that how how can we make this network? And in most cases, it's not that that much that you have to add. This is, and you will see the pattern very clearly. You will see like, oh yeah, so I have to do this uh, most of the times. So I have to uh, check the, the player, take ownership, or grab the component I want to um, to synchronize, and all these things that we were we were talking about. Yeah, I'm not sure if anyone else have um have any questions um, i guess there's probably a lot of questions because it was a lot quite a lot I, i'd just like to say thank you for sharing i think it's great and we're loving this um i'm looking forward to getting involved uh in a big way probably a little bit later in the year i don't have um it's not on my docket yet but it will be uh and i'll be getting seriously into it i think Drew had some good questions earlier on in the presentation around ownership that kind of might be interesting just to give us an example on. You talked about the latching version of ownership. I can't quite see at a glance when you would use that latching system and when you wouldn't use it. Can you give us a um, bit more detail on that? Well, let me see. Go back. Oh, wait. There's a bit later, I guess. Um... You refer to the to the this one, right? <clears throat> the shared state and keeping uh, shared state for yes, for yeah for gating ownership, sort of, right? Yeah, because Drew Drew was saying why why doesn't this also have like the race condition of the previous example, the animation example? How have you got around that by having introducing this latch? Um, yeah, so this is based on these. You mean this, like we were talking about this. Exactly, right? yeah, yeah. So you have the ownership wars. So there's there's obviously a race condition there, depending on who grabbed first or last. Yeah. Um, but how, how do you avoid that by the introduction of a latch? Why why isn't there a race condition on grabbing the latch, for instance? Oh, okay, yeah. Do you mean like do you have, do you have to check if it's the, the local player, right? So So not all of them are triggered at the same time. So you mean the I difference guess. between this and this is the so here we have like we check if it's a local player and I mentioned that that was a 
we need to do that because otherwise uh, that oh, sure. would no, be... the local player one i i get but it's the one where where t two people may enter the same volume and trigger a common animation yeah um yeah just that kind of um how does that how does that work with the latch then how does that help you in this situation i, I didn't yeah, quite so... get the flow Okay, so yeah, so let's go over it again. So you have two two avatars, and then the first one enters the trigger volume, right? Uh, so this this is this uh, avatar is taking or this client is taking ownership of that entity, which is the door in this case, for example, and it plays the open animation, right? So from in that moment, that player is gonna be uh, synchronizing the animation properties with the rest of the clients. So the rest of the clients will sort of start playing the the animation of the, the door opening because because this, those properties and are being networked by that client and, and is the legit owner. So suddenly everybody's playing that. But then the second uh, after there's another player that gets into the the same trigger. And now uh, as the as the graph does like the the graph the first thing that the graph does after after entering the trigger volume is taking ownership of the door so the second player goes and takes ownership of, of the door uh, but nothing is stopping that player from taking ownership of the door because the ownership is not guaranteed so it's the latest one uh, taking ownership is the owner so now the second player is the owner of the door and now it's going to start synchronizing its animation so it's going to play the animation it's going to start synchronizing the animation properties with the rest of the objects because the graph is going to execute for him too or for her or for them so so this is this is what i was meaning with the ownership board so it's like uh, you own the object but if you don't stop another player from from owning uh the same object then the first player is going to start syncing the animation properties the second one is going to start syncing the animation properties uh, a second after and then um you know the state of the animation is probably going to be messed up because you most of the clients will have like a halfway played animation and then uh, another like the second player like plays it again or change the time of the animation or whatever and then that messed up the animation so you probably will see some sort of like uh, weirdness going on so that's yeah. that's why i was talking about yeah. that's why i was talking about this third state where where what you do is um yeah, you, you, what you do is just after, right after taking ownership, you just set this search state and say, like, you set this flag. It's like, oh, this is taken. And now anyone entering the, the any other player entering that uh, collider, then we'll see that is taken because that state is synchronized and the taken state is synchronized on that entity. So they have access to that value and say, like, oh, this is now true so i can't really take ownership of this because it's taken uh, i right. but, but what what drew drew says is is that um there's a potential race condition there isn't there because you're going to yeah you could both think you had it because there's Always. no server authority yeah so if i mean if i, I wouldn't argue that i mean it's potential that um, if the two players enter like almost at the same time uh, it will also happen, but so far I think is the most that we can do. So like gating the, um, so it, could, it could be potential for race condition, but uh, so far uh, the way ownership works now, and, and if this is very problematic, we might end up, up doing some changes, but right now the state of the of the system is uh, is where it is now, like, like this. So this is the shared state can help you to, to get the access. I think you could still resolve it. I mean, if you, if you, um, along with, if you stored the, obviously the owner who owns the latch and you stored the time that they think they grabbed it, then somebody coming along would have to compare to that time. And then they couldn't really stake a claim. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, if then, if then two people end up thinking they've owned it, there's going to be two different timestamps at that point. And then that, that becomes the tiebreaker. You'd have to you'd have to take ownership and check that you've kept ownership, maybe, but in some way. But that would be that would give you an unambiguous ownership property. Uh, do you mean checking if you are the owner after taking ownership? 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So there's like an additional check we've actually yeah. revisited. Yeah. No. This is there's actually another note that we have is just take. Um, well, you can do. You could just take ownership, wait, and and then check if you are the owner. There's actually a right. note that is like uh, is. Well, I didn't I didn't show that note here. Yeah. This, but there is a note that yeah, this that, is, that's am the I same. the owner? So you can resolve yeah, it. Yeah. Resol Depending on your case, you can you might be able to resolve it also waiting and yeah, um, yeah and, and checking if you are the owner. So if you have waited like next time and then you are the owner, but you can uh, you can guarantee that you are the owner because uh, nobody yeah. else can enter if the flag is set and and you have waited. So you you can resolve in in, in different ways. Um, it, it sounds fixable to me. I would say to um, can, Drew saying there about having a server for ownership and an authority. I would say that I I kind of like the serverless option that Hubs is kind of embracing because it does mean you just you know you just have to trust the clients to trust each other. It's not great for gaming, um, but it's great mm. for kind of like a social system because it, the server load's really low. And the, the server holds no state. Which I yeah. you know, is obviously advantageous. Um, I, I can see the benefits of like server authority state, but there's also a huge number of kind of gotchas with it. Yeah, yeah, and is this soft ownership model is, is something that was uh, implemented since the very beginning? And um, yeah, I mean maybe for some specific cases can be problematic, and we might need to resolve this under the road. It does. Uh, is very problematic, but we thought that so far for social experiences might be enough um, to just yeah. like. I think that latch problem is probably solvable. I, I can see a couple of routes there, but that's I, I agree. Yeah, like it, good good enough is is good is is fine for hubs in certainly at this stage. As long as there's a as long as there's a route to eventual correctness, um, I think it's, it's right. Good. Like I don't see someone trying to make a very competitive multiplayer game in here, um, with, right. and expect you know uh fairness and like you know pro proper scoring and and you know non-cheating and stuff yet um but yeah. i loved I, first of all i just want to say to to especially the people in the chat like the fact that we're having these conversations now is super exciting to me because it means that we can move forward and and uh, yeah, try to definitely. meet people's yeah. needs and and get new ideas and ways of solving these problems which is great these are definitely the right questions aren't they Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know I mean, there's a lot of to debate here, and, and I ho hopefully I hope that the, everyone is is excited enough to just to keep on, um, you know, talking about this and discussing and maybe finding new and better solutions, or or maybe we believe that this is uh, enough for the time being. I mean, there's a probably for for some time we we will keep on working with this model um, because there's a lot of stuff to work on. As I said, like for completeness is like a bunch of components that need nodes that is not really hard work. I mean, it's, it's not really uh, complicated to implement because it's basically like in many cases, just copy pasting uh, nodes and changing properties and this is adding code, but that is quite a lot of work. So so that will require some time to add all that, um, to, to add nodes and properties for every node and make Every component network, so you can't use any Blender component at all, and 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 make sure that all that is is being networked correctly in all clients and stuff. So that's a, that's the first milestone: is having uh, the whole component stack network. So any experience that you have, that you can create now, or every component that you can attach now to have seen, will work in a network way, and, and you have the nodes to to set and get properties and do things. And but yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, hopefully this is a community effort cool. and, and we can keep on solving these problems together. Yeah, no, I, I see possibilities. Like uh, I think Drew and I, we, we're, we're developers, so we, we see the problems first before we see the fun. Like, but I can see that. I promise you I can see the fun. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, it's a lot of fun. Again, they say, uh, they say um, fo football managers can't enjoy watching football because they, they only see, they don't see great goals, they only see defensive mistakes. Yeah, software architects. <laughs> yeah, it's a good comparison, definitely. Yeah, um, I mean, so far, what's gotten me excited is that anytime I've been in a in a casual conversation, whether it was with a, another Mozilla person or or 
community member and we've just sort of tossed around ideas like i wonder if with this system you could do you know x like maybe we could try this thing um and then anything i've tried so far with with some caveats has been like yeah actually that kind of works um and so that to me shows that if if it's already in that stage where we're we're pushing the boundaries of things um and we don't even have all the features in yet um that's a really good sign yeah definitely, definitely. Yeah, i think it's a great points. yeah a lot of i think one of the things that people were requesting the most like oh i want to make like escape rooms or things like that for, okay. which is the yeah making i at the beginning of the presentation I talk about oh you can make a game maybe maybe making games is not the goal of this project i mean the goal is more like creating like like rich social interactive experiences um, yeah, exactly. and escape room is a, is a good very good example of that and and this i think this has the power even right now the, the current state has the power to to create you can create cool escape rooms with with what we have at this moment working i mean you can sure. create rooms uh, escape rooms that work and you can it's similar to a real escape room and, and you can so it's like and it's only like we only have like a few nodes network and, and a couple of things so i think it's a it's a good potential manuel can i share anything? in zoom to show a couple of things oh yeah yeah let me uh have you got i noticed on the um, yours. the future chart you had some um uh, like what you call nav mesh stuff. Have you got any of that working yet? Because that's going to be like super important to prioritize. Uh, uh, no, the, the oh, you're talking to. Oh, you're talking to Jim. Sorry. <laughs> either, either, yeah, no, because that's going to be. show um you guys can see my screen in there right in hub yeah um uh, the, the reason i wanted to show this was this was something that imaginer and i were discussing a couple weeks ago and we were like i wonder if you could do that because we we loved the idea something that comes up again and again especially for educators is ways of like wrangling <laughs> students or wrangling a class full of people that are visiting a space um you know like go off and explore and then when i want i want everybody back here you know at a certain time or after, when the time runs out and um so we have the ability to use you know the the teleport um and to call it in behavior graph and in this example we made it just kind of work like uh being able to say this object um is being tracked like its location um but only when i hit the button when i hit the button it teleports me to that thing so like the idea that a person could carry you know a microphone around or something and they're they're the leader um you know and then at any point they can hit a button and pull everybody in you know or some, something like that um that's just a really simple umbrella. dumb example but something that wasn't possible before without this system and um cool. it's cool because those powers were there all along you know all the functions to teleport and to you know get positions and all that right. stuff we just didn't expose it um so that's yeah. just one. Um, but then, um, uh, you know, Manuel mentioned the the escape room kind of thing. And so, you know, I was thinking about what are the what are the sorts of um, things that people do in escape rooms, right? Like objects that you need that you can't get yet because they're locked, mm -hmm. you know, or mm -hmm. like buttons that don't work because they need power or, you know, like that sort of thing. And so you know, being able to detect objects, well, that was the wrong object, but I made it say power on, oops, this one does give power. Mm -hmm. And now the button works, and then I can trigger yeah. an animation with it. And, you know, have mm -hmm. physics work and, you know, all that stuff now that we can do grabbables. And um, so that sort of uh, logic and stuff, very simple to set up, like not super complex. And but but the depth that you could add to a scene is huge. I mean, because I, I used to feel like if I wanted to make a hubs room that was cool and that got a lot of use and, and reuse, then I just have to keep making it bigger and bigger, like physically bigger. Um, and I love the idea that 
this sort of stuff adds depth and, and layers to a scene um, without having to make a gigantic space. Um, so it's just, you know, another way of thinking. That's great. That's really good. Um, and then, uh, oh, uh, Pink Polygon, you were saying stuff about video. Th this was an example of like, I have a video playing. Um, I made a separate play pause button for it um, just because I didn't want controls on the screen, right? Um, but then in, in this, uh, I just have, imagine these are uh, videotapes uh, and the triggers in the corner. If I put one of these in the corner, it plays a different video, right? But the play pause button is still universal, right, for the video. But I can put it back and play it's, it's something Video else. tapes then. Yeah, I should have made it a, I should have made it a tape. Actually, I don't remember where the trigger is, so. I think you saw me an example where you were actually like um, uh, rolls, like film rolls that you put on the. Which one? I, no, I remember an ex uh, like an, uh, an example that you saw me that were you were actually switching like film rolls, like movie. Oh yeah, that that's part of my puzzle. So I don't know if I want to give it away, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm making an escape room and I want people to try it, and so I'm a little bit like, uh, I don't want. Really okay, know. yeah. I don't exactly. know want to spoil my puzzles yet, but. This was the example of like, okay, you can go in here, there's nav mesh everywhere. I was looking for a way to uh, block it off if I hit a button. Um, yeah. And so this just, you know, pops you back out if you try to go in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think for perfect, the nav mesh, the nav mesh thing, I wonder, I haven't tried that. <clears throat> I wonder if you can just like, <clears throat> keep track uh, locally of the, like in a variable of the position of the player. And then we enter, you, you place like a trigger volume in the door. And when you enter that, you just like keep on resetting the player position to the, right. something like that. Right, right. Sort of similar. I think you, you're you going to have to make that bit super easy because that is that is the, the kind everything. of example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just got to make sense and be simple and kind of be like, oh, yeah, just drop that there. And there you go. There's your door with the button. Don't want yep. too many workarounds because you're going to have like workarounds on the workarounds. Anyway, so it'll get confusing. Yeah. Well, and then for those that didn't no, see I appreciate like, this difficult. earlier iterations of this stuff, I mean, being able to ha to track things like proximity, you know, like being able to figure out like in logic, like, oh, these two objects and how close they are to each other affects something like their brightness, you know, I, I, like even something as simple as that. I, I I know the people in this room well enough to know that, and I know what types of people are in this room. That you know, your your mind is already going like, oh, I could make a whole yeah. game mechanic out of that, or like with the sword, the sword from the Hobbit that it puts right, the, hot the, or cold. You know, am I close to the to the exit? I'm yeah. in a maze and I have a light, or when I'm near another player, we light up, and so I know we're near. Oh, or really nice. so many different things, right? And that's just one little simple graph that's checking their their distance, you know, hmm. um, and we'll 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 show the graphs, you know, later and, and get into like how to do that stuff. But yeah, one of the things that <clears throat> they want to work um, next uh, on is is making the graphs reusable, so to uh, enable the concept of prefabs, which right now is like if you see, you remember the the graph that I was showing before, most of the nodes you have to specify the entity you have to specify like oh the door trigger or the door um so yeah i mean one of the first things i want to do is like uh, change that so you have like an op always an option to just default to self um because in many cases that give you the default to self then you can just like copy paste the object place in a different position it will work uh, or copy paste the hierarchy if, if there is a trigger and an object and you need both to work together then if you specify like self, then basically like everything will work um, when duplicating the code, and and you can use the same graph in two different uh, objects and create like this concept of prefab and just like have a library of uh, different things that have their own uh, node graph um, embedded, and that will work everywhere you drop it because it's self. Uh, it's, it's just references cool itself idea. or the hierarchy. Uh, Route, yeah, that's pretty key for reusability. That yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's the. I want to focus on that, uh, like next, almost because I think once you have that, then it's like this is really powerful, and you can do like a lot of uh, creating much more 
uh, quickly. This is just a trigger, triggering animation and text appearing. Yeah. Very it's cool. like those text objects are there the whole time. They're just their their text is off. Now I can actually change the text and the colors and those things that we have. I mean, I think some of these are actually interactive. Yeah, I can click on them or scale them a little bit. And, you know, so so the educational cool use thing. cases become huge, right? Like ways of yeah. it's basically you're making your own little science museum of fun widgets right. and things. Well, I think we we literally had like in our kind of tech demo for our grammable feature, we literally had the same model. It didn't look quite as cool as this. But, um, I just I stole that off Sketchfab, but you know. Yeah, I, I didn't make it. it. My demo. <laughs> but um, yeah, those sorts of things like it, it, it just expands what's possible, and and um, not everything has to be like a full game logic, you know, extravaganza. It's okay if it's just you know something that enhances the experience a little bit. And so I imagine a lot of people may just want it for those sorts of things too. It doesn't always have to be a, a you know, super complex logic. Hmm. Uh, I, I've got to bounce. This is absolutely super. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm also going to add drop. Uh, but one is anyone, anybody else has like a, like a question about the presentation or? Well, we'll have time to to get deeper into all these in future meetings. Bye, please. In future meetings, so like um, yeah, if you anybody has a question specifically about the presentation or any. Yeah. Hi. Um. I wanted to know when you guys uh, plan or think that VR support is going to be ready, like at least to play around with it, not production ready, but like in the early stages. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, right now the priority is probably like uh, focusing on on adding the remaining nodes. Uh, well, I mean, we we can make kind of the roadmap. It's not like set in stone so this is my my initial uh, thoughts that probably for like trying to have like parity with the with the with the components that we support now so so you don't have like a half bake like um, working solution where some components are not at work and some others are and then just focus on, on vr but uh, i might also like spend some time uh, testing VR because maybe there is not so much or so many things to that need, need to fix. And the, 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 the reason I said like this midterms is I haven't tested at all. I didn't have time to test in VR and I and I believe like Dom and correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, but I, I think in the past like VR wasn't a f the main focus of the project. So I know it was a status on that. Yeah, VR kind of took a back seat. Um... To be honest, it mostly came out of users, right? Like we knew, we, we had an idea of how many people we had visiting hubs on headsets and it was extremely low compared to desktop and other things. So if just given our, our resources, we chose to focus more on desktop stuff first. Mm. But was we a, haven't forgotten about the VR side. Like we, we definitely, I mean, we're happy that it kind of works. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's awesome. Uh, obviously, a lot of stuff has has sort of uh, gotten old, and uh, you know isn't as as full featured as it needs to be. I was uh, thinking specifically about the behavior graphs project. If you during the development you tested at all in VR, or you never really tested any of these uh, mm -mm. experiences in VR, right? So it, I just wonder if what's the status of that? If we have any idea, because I haven't really time. I haven't really had time to test, so I don't really know if it works at all, behavior graphs. So yeah, so I think the first, probably the first step is to test on in my work. And if it works, it's just like we will just focus on on supporting it, uh, moving on, but going on. I mean, but yeah, we have to first see what's the status of that. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, it, I mean, I'm completely new to the whole behavior uh, graph theme, so I will have to uh, like learn anyway, so I'm not in a rush, but uh, uh, mm. it would be really great to just like have something where I could like test for myself or with like, I wouldn't even need someone else in the room, but just like have a state where I can find out the stuff which I would also like find out on desktop, but 
directly do it in VR because we we mostly do educational products which are based on VR or at least the main component is that so it doesn't need to be like completely flushed out of all the features but like something that I can at least like train on already would be nice mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah, I will give it a, a try because I uh, because I mean uh, my understanding is like most of the things uh, there's nothing really specific to that shouldn't work in VR right now in behavior graphs. I think uh, the only thing is like we don't really have the specific support for for VR, so there's like we don't have notes uh, to check if you exit the VR mode or you know like these type of things or. Or, but the, in general, have, we do have like stuff for player, like your position and your and your head direction, yeah. like a couple things that might help in VR, like that. Um, but mm. yeah, not specific about like controllers and yeah, hands know, position. Kind of for example, I don't think we have any <clears throat> notes for hands positions, for example. Or so, yeah. But I mean, overall, uh, I think it should it should work to be okay. But that's my understanding with having tested. Yeah, I mean, it's already such a big leap from what is possible right now that uh, I think it's also nice to then get to it at some point when it works really well. But like, if I can press a button and something works, that's already amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and things like, I believe things like grabbing, uh, grabbing stuff, uh, grabbing objects, uh, uh, interacting with like, pressing buttons, those things should, should work the same. So it should be supported. So, so I think overall, the VR support should be pretty pretty good, but I haven't tested, so I can't just, I can't say for sure. Yeah, OK, sort of fine. Sort of yeah, no problem. Um, any other questions? Yeah, one short question. Yeah. Um. We are thinking about a learning education scenario when you can put something together like an engine of a car. And I think that would work pretty well. But um, the next stage would be that people can put together the different parts of the engine and then start it and see if they made any errors. And the errors would be uh, based on the mistakes they made by putting them together. And that could be become very complex very quickly, I think. And um, do you have any kind of feeling if this would be too much for the current state? For uh, mm -hmm. for example, if you lose the um, the overview because the nodes would be explode in a way. Hmm. I mean the um, the library that we are using is really powerful. Is it really like execute? Um, a lot of nodes, so I don't think the amount of nodes will be a problem. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how the experience is, so I will need to to think about it. But depending on the complexity, um, yeah, it's just, I guess it's just like we need to we need to or, or you need to figure out like seeing what's available, what nodes do we support, and if it's enough to support the experience for what you said, like like putting together an engine is pretty similar to what we've seen, like just moving things, placing them in uh, in media frames or in specific um, positions and, right. uh, and then keeping a state of what's the status, if they made like the, the put in the right place or not. And based on that, like some some text saying that so you're, uh, you're success or not, or like uh, green light, red light. So I, I think it's, it sounds to me like something doable, but yeah, maybe um, depending yeah. on the complexity depth, maybe I'm missing things. True, true. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I was okay. just uh, answering Imaginer. Uh, like we need more, we will need more like granularity on our interacts and things. Um, VR makes that even more apparent, but like even even with mouse, like we need things like when I let go of the mouse or when I just put my cursor over it versus clicking mm -hmm. it and you know, like just more details so that we can make more complex interactions. But we'll we'll get there. You know, they're all just like they're they're all on the big list of priorities and uh pretty much daily, almost daily Manuel will ask me, Hey, like what do you need next? Like what's the what's the most important thing? And 
um, I think now that there are more people becoming aware of this, um, that, that may get more complicated. People might have different opinions about what's the most next important thing to work on, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Right now, this point is driven by what we need internally for uh, for creating experiences. Um, and I guess, like, the, one of the interesting parts of opening this is like the rest of the community have a chance to also, you know, like voice their their needs, and we can integrate that into the prioritization. Or if maybe like we think something is very important and then a lot of people need some of the thing and we can focus on that based on the interest yeah but this is yeah it's like a gruyere cheese now it's like a lot of holes and we need to fill those holes uh as i said like a lot of nodes that only have like three properties because or components that the nodes the related nodes only have like three uh sockets for changing properties because those are the ones that uh, jim and christian needed uh, so those were the first ones to, to be added. So so just finishing, like completing all that and adding support for, for all the properties or most of the networking materials is pretty important. I think that also needs to be addressed early. Um, but yeah, like it's step by step. Okay. Um, well, if there is not any more questions and let me know otherwise because I can't really read the chat. Uh, uh, oh yeah, if you want to create like a solo game board, do you have kind of the same issue? Um, there's like component, I mean, if you can make it with the available components, so with the things that we have, the nodes that are now exposed, then that's fine. But there is a lot of components that don't have like the counterpart, counterpart nodes. So you can really change properties on those even local um so so that might be yeah, it, it all depends on the type of experience as you've seen like christian has been showing like pretty pretty cool stuff and it's been done with super limited uh nodes so um, so this definitely really cool stuff can be can be made but but maybe you can you need to get very creative and very um you know like looking for tricks and doing things in certain ways and hiding things and uh but eventually we'll be there with the with the node feature parity. All right. Uh, well, yeah. Hey Manuel. Um, hey. With regard to uh, setting component properties, uh, yeah. Jim and I were talking about that recently, and uh, I think it would be better to integrate all that into one node that just uh travels through the component registry and exposes all the components and properties so that we can pick up any custom components for people to buy yeah um, no I, I remember talking about that's an option um yeah i mean yeah well, i think we, we talked with also with christian about that that that's something that can be having a one node, this is like a design choice, so to speak, like having one node where you can change any property from any component um, or having a specific nodes for all of them, like in categories. So, so far uh, since the beginning, the, the specific path was chosen, like acting on or having categories and specific nodes for, because a general, I think a general node can also get a bit messy uh, because it has to like deal with a lot of complexity. Um, so yeah, well, maybe well, down the road we can figure out a good way. Because so, I think we can just add a couple drop down lists, uh, enum properties to the node. So yeah. If, if the nodes are like all the rest of the parts of Blender. Yeah, no, it could be, but uh, maybe, yeah. Well, we'll need to think about it. I mean, it can be also like something that we just add at some point and, um, and then can be another node. And if that eventually works better, then we can just uh, keep it or remove other nodes. I, mean, I don't, I'm not against it. It's just like, 
um, so far it's been just easier to to do it this way because it's um, right. Um, it was faster. So do do you have to add like specific support um, for changing stuff for each component to the client or um, like uh, can can you like is there a generic um, API for changing a component's property? Um, no, I mean on the on the Blender side, it's just like a, it's a it's a node, um, no and you just on the hub side. On the hub side, yeah, on the hub side, you will need to. I mean, that will be like a monstrous uh, node on the hub side, because all the logic is, is lies there. So it's on the, on the Blender side, it's just like a node and with some ins and outs, and that's it. But on the on the hub side, that will need to deal. But I mean, it could be yeah. Could be an interesting node to have, like set property on component, and then you choose the the entity, you choose the component, and based on the on the component, then you show different properties, which are like the properties from the component. So yeah, I think it it could be really useful, um, and I think yeah, I have it somewhere, like in my to do list, like explore that. Uh, but yeah, I'm as I said, like I think it can be. Can be a good a good alternative too. It's like yeah, yeah. I I think I think it shouldn't be all that difficult because uh, I think once you have it on the hub side, it should basically just be you pass it the entity that it's supposed to uh, be set on. You press pass it the property name and you pass it the property value. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and and then the Blender add-on is responsible for making sure the property name and value are correct and like supported by Hub. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, I agree. It's like a, I think it's uh, it can work um, because it can be really um, automated. Like, okay, get the, all the components, parse all its. Um, properties and then expose them um, so yeah, i think it could it could work so um okay. that might be something to to look into yeah 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 and, and i'm uh glad to help and work up the ui on the blender side and uh possibly on the hub side if uh once i get into the Upside of things if I get into the upside of behavior draft. Yeah. Yeah, sure. That yeah, will be really helpful. I mean, if somebody wants to take over any of these things, like, or like to say, creating that could be really useful. Um, but yeah, we'll have an opportunity to talk about about yeah. these in future meetings. Yep, so, yep.